So here's a pre quick preamble. Robots, artificial intelligence, cognitive computing capabilities are already making their mark on delivery systems around the world. Innovation and policy are converging and influencing uh, delivery models. And with improved connectivity, data connectivity, electronic health records, uh, digitization of healthcare and data, um, there's having an impact on models of care, of delivery around the world. So our panel tonight, is, today rather, is going to talk about what, what will or can the healthcare delivery of the future look like. We're trying to address, and you'll notice from the panel, um, panelists that we have, very esteemed panelists we have here that uh, I'll introduce briefly. We're trying to address all aspects of kind of the things we, we think about. Um, I'm sure there's probably some other representation missing here, but um, maybe be good. That, I guess we've all been patients at some point, right? So that's all, that's all good to be represented. So, but let me get started by briefly introducing you all to the panelists, and then we'll get started right into the, um, uh, the topic at hand. So to my left is um, the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of New York Presbyterian, Emmy Delan. Uh, Emmy is a, uh, a proud MBA graduate of Columbia Business School. I can say that. Um, uh, as I said, she's the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for New York Presbyterian. New York Presbyterian is an $8 billion academic healthcare delivery system in New York, in the New York metropolitan area with 4,000 beds. NYP is affiliated with Weill Cornell Medical School and Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, Emmy is responsible for enterprise-wide strategy, service lines, and New York Presbyterian's Venture Fund. Emmy serves on the board of the um, New York Presbyterian Health Policy Center. So thank you, Emmy, for joining us today. Um, Tracy Ball, to, to, the, to the next left, uh, is an executive vice president of health plans for CVS Health. Um, Tracy is responsible for the growth, profitability, and performance of the company's business, serving health plans, insurance companies, and other healthcare payers. Prior to his role at CVS um, Health, uh, Tracy served as a special advisor at General Atlantic, a growth, global growth equity for, um, firm, where he focused on activities in the healthcare sector. Um, during that period, he was also served as the executive chairman of MDON, a General Atlantic portfolio company. Tracy also has an MBA from Columbia Business School. I also have to mention that Emmy serves on the Columbia Business School uh, Healthcare and Pharmaceutical Management uh, Program Advisory Board, as does Roy, and as do I. Um, I want to make sure that we, we note that. Uh, next to Tracy is Swagat Banerjee. Uh, Swagat is, is, a senior, is a Vice President and Data Science Leader for Welltower. He leads his firm's in, uh, Business Insight Group and works across business segments functions and information management to align data analytics um, and business strategy. He leads their big data and predictive analytic solutions to provide statistical models for informed decision making. Thank you, Thank you for joining Swagat. Um, and then Anthony uh, Girardi is a, is a healthcare executive um, from the advisory board, now Optum, I believe. Um, and he has a proven track record of, of developing and deploying innovative strategies uh, to drive organic growth and acquisitions, partnerships and strategic investments in healthcare IT, services, and other healthcare segments. He works globally with companies and to develop innovation, innovative strategies and new offerings and customer experience in healthcare and other markets. And then last but not least, the man, well, he has a name now. <laughs> man at the end. <laughs> the man at the end, who needs no introduction, um, Roy Barano. Roy is the, um, it is joined Physicians Endoscopy in April of last year as Chief Strategy Officer as part of the sale of Frontier Healthcare. Frontier Healthcare was a company that Roy had uh, previously co-founded. Physicians Endoscopy is a private equity-backed national healthcare company that specializes in development, management <clears throat> of freestanding single specialty and endoscopic ASCs in partnership with practicing physicians and hospitals. Um, Physicians Endoscopy has developed or acquired uh, 60 GI centers across 18 states and has performed approximately 500,000 procedures annually. So all good aspects of the delivery system, what the future delivery system can be. But let's start with, with Emmy. So Emmy, what areas of opportunity is New York Presbyterian pursuing um, that you believe will help the healthcare delivery system of the future? So, well, I'm taking from here, okay, well I feel sorry for you guys, or maybe you're lucky you can't see me. 
Um, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel. Um, I, I am amused that last week I was asked to give a talk on uh, what was our strategy to move from fee-for-service to value and how are we going to handle the competition in New York and how are we going to handle our competition nationally. And I found I'm giving the same answer to this question today as I did to answer those three questions, so I must be incredibly disingenuous now in the way I look at the world, or maybe I've been in, this mar in, in the marketplace for almost 40 years, and, and uh, the more you think it changes, the less it actually changes. But the way that New York Presbyterian, and, and we have a, um, really added five hospitals. We were $4 billion four years ago, and now we're an $8 billion in institution. And we have the same four challenges that everybody has. We're, our, our goal is easy access, it's terrific patient experience, it's top quality and safety, and finally, um, it is reducing our costs. And the way we've looked at it is there are four drivers in which we have 45,000 employees plus our affiliated two schools. So we really have to have a message for trying to all move in the same direction. And the four drivers are one, standardization. We made the decision last year that we were all moving on to the same instance of EPIC as a move to standardization. We are moving to clear all roles and responsibilities so there are standardized roles and responsibility across the institution. We are looking at processes and procedures and standardizing. So that's, that's a first fundamental driver. The second fundamental driver is we're regionalizing. So we have made decisions that where we're going to provide what care and where we're going to integra integrate what administrative functions so that we really have, we probably will take us four or five more years, and an integrated delivery system across all of our institutions. Third is, and this is the subject at hand, is we have made major investments in virtualization. We fundamentally think that this is where the physical assets meet the virtual assets, and this is the way we're going to be able to leverage easy access, we're going to be able to improve the patient experience. We're going to be able to improve quality, and we're going to be able to reduce our cost. If we don't have to spend $2,000 per square foot to add more physical assets, it's going to be a huge win for every everybody. So we ha launched our NYP On Demand, which is our telehealth um, it is due to do about 150,000 visits this year across a spectrum of services. So we have everything from the urgy care visits, we have a relationship with ZocDoc, and we have kiosks at Walgreens now. I think we're the first in the country to develop the kiosk. And so we have, the first is, the urgy care. We have a second offering called Express Care, and Express Care, to me, sounded like a stupid idea. It's turned out to be one of our better ideas. If you go to the emergency room and you can, you, you don't have a lot of complications, you can be seen um, virtually rather than physically by a doctor, and it reduces your wait time from about two and a half hours to less than 30 minutes, and we have had a net promoter score of 94, and we've had 90 94-year-olds use it, and we've had five-year-olds use it, and all with equal uh, success. And the hope is, is that as we try to, you know, one of the big challenges with with these these new ways of seeing doctors is making sure that it fits into sort of the routine of the doctor, and it also fits into what the patients are comfortable with. And then the next time they don't they don't feel they need to come into the emergency room, they can get into our urgy care app and be able to see it. The third is peer to peer, fundamentally changing the way we've been able to connect our hospitals. 
So we're able to do stroke, we're able to do psych, we're able to do derm, we're able to do peds. Most surprising to me is that psych has been the most popular of all. So patients in a crisis are very willing to talk to a psychiatrist. There are only 5,000 um, adolescent psychiatrists, board certified psychiatrists in this country. So for us to be able to take, be able to see a patient in an hour rather than in three days, five days is, is an incredible uh, development. Um, so increasingly there are more and more specialties that we are able to do peer to peer to be able to either do it in the emergency room or we can do it within um, the ICUs and, and across a spectrum of services. And then, and then we also have a mobile uh, stroke unit um, and then we are establishing our remote monitoring capability so we will be able to do chronic care that's going to be launched in um, uh, in probably the next four weeks and then we have follow-up visits we are able to successfully take care of even transplant people who have transplants to see their follow-up visits virtually rather than bringing down so I think the way that we look at the the, the the big challenge is how do you take what is a transactional interchange right now which is where we are with virtual to really making it relational and being able to figure out how can we, by disease by disease, be able to look at where can we support the patient virtually rather than making them come in and spend $40 to park. And it's around the corner, but it's going to be a difficult way to thinking about how do you scale this. You can't scale it by interrupting a doctor who has now seen patients in the office and say, oh, take the next four hours and see, that and see a bunch of virtual. You gotta really think of it completely differently. You gotta have doctors who are going to be on call to do this virtual stuff. You're gonna have nutritionists, you're gonna have a whole set of services that are gonna be offered in a completely different way. We, we also are doing a variety of, how many more minutes do I have? Um, a variety of uh, projects using, using artificial intelligence. So we have, a, uh, we have one in uh, our length of stay. We've saved 25,000 patient days last year. Use, with the help of, it's not the only thing, but we've got a predictive modeling capability real time that sends out nudges for PT, for MRIs and the like, and it is very effective in helping. Similarly, we are starting to change the whole way we're doing back office functions using um, robotic processing automation. Um, and that is proving to be extremely successful in terms of the elimination of errors and also the re reduction of uh, staffing. Um, we're also starting to use it clinically. We are uh, working with a company that actually I could do an echocardiogram. I know that's frightening for everybody in this room. It's frightening for me to think about it, but it actually works. It actually has enough acquisition of images to be able to work. So in, in, overall, Patrick, I think that, that we are at the embryonic, but we are at the cusp of fundamentally rethinking our delivery model. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's amazing because you think of an academic medical center and you think vertical, but what you're doing is going virtual and horizontal and it's and it's fascinating and um, it shows the power of uh, New York Presbyterian um, it's wonderful so Tracy let's turn to you now there was apparently an announcement of a CVS at the merger got some news last year we'll see what happens with it but I really want to focus of on for purpose of this context of this panel what's the what's sort of the, the sharing of the future vision that you you see and how potentially the transaction could uh, could enable that vision should it close you know what, what's interesting in retrospect the announcement of our transaction was probably the worst kept secret in the history of American business um, and as you began to hear those rumors in retrospect they are uh, disturbingly accurate uh, particularly around the details of the transaction. But they were also disturbingly inaccurate, particularly around the premise for the transaction. You heard things like this is a knee-jerk reaction to Amazon's feared or potential or someday entry somehow into the healthcare space, as if a $180 billion company would in a couple weeks throw together a $60 billion deal to preempt a rumor. Uh, there was... Um, <laughs> 
there, there, uh, there was some suggestion that we were going to become a health plan, that we were acquiring Aetna to become a health plan. Uh, now, Aetna today represents about 10% of our revenue. They're a client today. Um, we would sacrifice a fairly significant amount of our revenue base mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to, to pursue that premise. So, um, wholly false. Uh, and a host of other um, tr uh, uh, suggestions that, uh, in the end, um, were, were relatively false. Uh, the true premise for the transaction is the extension and continuation of a vision that's been in place at the organization for quite some time and is directionally not all that inconsistent from what you just heard from Emmy. I mean, the, the fundamental concepts and spirit of what I think we're all trying to accomplish was embedded in our vision. I do need to talk to you about that whole Walgreens thing. Uh, I don't know what, <laughs> where you went awry there, but... Uh, it's okay, that. Troy was in my office last week. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. We still have a shot. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, good, good. I might put my money on Troy on this one. Uh, uh, Troy Brennan's our chief medical officer and a great guy. Uh, uh, so uh, over the past several decades, um, the, the company has had this vision that we could transform in certain pockets, if not someday um, more meaningful pockets, the healthcare industry through the interactions we have with consumers. And in order to continue to better those interactions, we needed not only to be true to that mission, but also begin to build capability. The true to that mission part was doing some very difficult, both practically and financially things, like dropping the sale of tobacco uh, in, our, in our retail stores. It was very difficult for us to reconcile in our minds um, this role of helping a consumer live a healthier life with behind us, we had a wall full of tobacco. It did not, um, it was not consistent with that mission. That was a $2 billion uh, revenue hit for us. Um, and by the way, has largely been replaced over time um, with volume from people who liked what we did there. That was not our intent, by the way. That was a, a pleasant surprise. And by the fact that um, most of the tobacco uh, purchases, um, we assumed every other purchase in a tobacco basket would go away too, and we're finding over time tobacco is becoming a lone and singular purchase, um, and people are still coming and buying all the other stuff that they did from us and buying their cigarettes or tobacco somewhere else. Um, so uh, while that was a hard spiritual and conceptual thing for us to, to do, it, it, it has worked out well over time, and other things um, that we have done in the retail stores is part of that spiritual mission. As part of the practical uh, capability side, uh, as uh, I've been with the company four years, a month after I joined the company, I was called into a meeting with our senior team, and we began asking ourselves these questions. If we are going to live this mission, what kinds of capabilities do we need over time that we don't have today? And things like data, multi-dimensional data, mm -hmm. that is richer than what we have access to today became critically important. Second, the ability to engage in services and capabilities beyond the pharmacy window or the pharmacy interaction um, became critically important. Uh, connectivity to the provider and delivery system um, became critically important. And when you think about those kinds of capabilities, who has them? Health plans. Health plans have all of those things. I would add that maybe a fourth on um, financing capability. While we have some modest financing capabilities, we have the largest uh, Part D plan in the country, SilverScript. Um, it does not have the versatility to do the kind of risk and insurance type financing that we'd like to do over time. So you take those four components and who has those kinds of things? Health plans. Um, and at that point, we began looking at this idea of um, would, would we build those capabilities separately or would we build them in a single transaction? Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, if you might recall, a mating dance a couple of years ago between a bunch of those big uh, players and we had to wait for that to shake out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this transaction became uh, viable for us. Um, Aetna in particular is a great partner in the fact that they believe in, and see that same vision. Um, about uh, transforming healthcare in a way that is meaningful for consumers. So in the end, our hope is through these combined capabilities and assets, we can become this healthcare home or healthcare hub that manifests itself both physically and virtually. Manifests itself over the pharmacy counter, in the front of the store, in other parts of the store where you might interact with CVS Health in ways that you have never in the past, uh, in your home, uh, in remote sensing, telemedicine, and virtual relationships in our minute clinics and the like. 
that this home or this hub is not a physical place, but an entity that you turn to when you think about your health and well-being needs. And when you turn to it, it provides you information, support, counseling, and direction at a time when you need it most. Now, this, the history of this industry is littered with the carcasses of people who have stood before groups just like this and said the exact same thing and failed. Um, I'm, we are not the first ones to say that, um, and, and, uh, and lots of others today share that same passion and vision. Um, so this, from this point forward, is as much about execution and making that happen as it is about the strategy that underlies that execution. So the, the, if you can imagine going forward a very different kind of entity that might be branded CBS Health mm -hmm. that begins to provide counseling and support uh, in a, a relationship direct to consumers that meets consumers where they are with relevant information that can help them along their way. Not as a replacement to any dimension of the healthcare delivery system, but as an augmentation, support, collaboration, and integrated uh, element to the way that healthcare is delivered today. Um, one great example is diabetes. You can take um, that, that example. Um, a patient with diabetes has significant uh, complexity in their daily lives. They, they will visit the pharmacy 12 to 15 times a month, uh, provided uh, they, they, um, um, they don't do anything by mail. They will have repeated uh, tests across the, um, their, uh, their continuum of care. Um, and gaps in care um, are both costly and cumbersome physically to those patients' recovery. Um, we have the ability to reach those patients where they are um, with a connected, uh, a connected glucometer with, with telemetry that, that allows us to remote monitor that, that progress. It allows us to, to connect that across Epic, which is our platform as mm -hmm. well. Um, we are the largest uh, installed Epic base in the country now, and, um, and through Epic connected 90% of the EHRs uh, in, in the country. Um, so we have the ability to connect that patient's, to, patient's progress to everyone else in the healthcare delivery system that's, that's uh, part of their care program. Um, we have the ability to provide them with all of the pharmaceutical needs they have, with the regular testing they need. We can identify gaps in care when they come into the store. They can come in this, to the store if so allow if they allow with a remote beacon that tells us they're in they're in the store, and that allows us to identify them and share with them the information we see on their the course of their treatment. Did you know that you needed your podiatry exam and your retina exam today? And if you and, and if you got a minute, we could step down to the amena clinic and you could have those two things done. Gap and care closed. Patient um, has a better, happier lifestyle. They cost less, and and the access to that to that care has been much more convenient. When you think about how those who desire to improve our health and well-being typically are unwanted intruders in our daily lives, right? They are typically people who call us at dinner time from our health plan. Um, look, I've been, I was in a health plan for 20 years, most of my life, um, and I was one of those. So, uh, and, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> trying to recover. Uh, I'm a recovering payer. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, and anywhere else that we interact, we have to kind of step out of what we're doing to engage the healthcare system, seemingly on their behalf, not ours. What we try to be is that person or that entity that meets you where you are. Think about five million people a day come into our stores. Five million people a day. Sometimes excitedly, but certainly um, uh, in a welcomed way. They welcome us into their homes. They engage with us with mile-long um, receipts that has valuable coupons attached. <laughs> they, um, they, <laughs> which you can now get digitally, by the way. So it's, um, um, we are a welcomed participant in their health and well-being lives at times when they're thinking about health and well-being. They're picking up a prescription. They're getting something done at, at the minute clinic. Um, we can meet them where they are at times with relevant, these teachable moments um, that can begin to connect the healthcare delivery system and make their lives better. So while often this transaction is portrayed as a transaction, mm -hmm. as a single, you know, big event, and it's a lot of money and all that, um, and, and it, it is all that, but it, it is more than that. It is perhaps one big step on a path toward this vision of becoming a very different kind of entity that serves consumers, knowing that there's a lot of risk and a lot, probably a lot of doubt, even among uh, probably people in this room, that we could actually achieve that. But we are driven by that passion. We're driven by that inspiration. And I know that millions of other people are, uh, particularly people on this on this table, sharing that same kind of vision. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about it, and uh, thank you. It could be a really meaningful change in the, the way healthcare is delivered.
That's very helpful, Tracy. So two things that both Tracy and Emmy had talked about that stand out for me. The relationship is moving towards, and, and healthcare is moving towards, transactional to relational. Exactly. So around diseases. Okay. And second, if Epic were a public company, we would make a boatload of money. Because obviously <laughs> they own the world at that point. Um, so I'll get, let's, talk, let's talk first on your perspective on envisioning the healthcare delivery system of the future through a senior housing and care lens. But start first, if you could talk to me about WellTower, what, well, you know, what WellTower is doing, and then relate it in terms of what Tracy talked about with the data, right, in terms of how this makes it different. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, the way I will start, give a quick background on where we are coming from. At WellTower, we are in the business of providing wellness. I'll elaborate on wellness a little bit uh, later. To the senior uh, population, in here. So if you look at it, I, I think we have almost uh, 1,400 properties across the country with more than 200,000 resident, senior resident in there. We cover the area of independent living, assisted living, and dementia care for these population. Now, if you think about the way we look at the whole healthcare system, uh, the chain we kind of uh, want to uh, look forward to, there are three major players in this. One is managing illness. The second one would be the managing care. And third one is managing wellness. So, so if you think about all of us here, we do talk about all three of this. Illness, we have the hospital systems. We have the post-acute care. For care, we have the outpatient medical, the senior nursing mm -hmm. facilities. When it comes to wellness, every different group of individual kind of address it differently. Till a certain age, we can take care of our own wellness with the help and support of this group. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to an aging population, we have to help them take their wellness seriously. Mm -hmm. and, and with Tom DeRosa, our CEO, he is a huge supporter and his vision is to play a major role in providing wellness to this senior population. So now, now, now coming back to how the delivery system should be integrated in this, right. if you look at each one of the senior population, they are not capable of going to your minute clinic as and when needed. We need to kind of integrate these various chains and bring it together, provide them the capability of access to this. But how do you do that? Interesting. <laughs> I'm not so, giving you a softball. I'm actually asking you. I don't know. <laughs> so, so that's where I think we, we are working very closely with the health system, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how we can leverage our properties. We do have the infrastructure in place. We just need to define a way. And that's what we are working closely with New York mm -hmm. and, and the pharmacies the both payer, uh, provider, and on the whole group okay. come together. They can be part of our property infrastructure. Right. They can have a you know, health system. So you could potentially have two partners here. Yes. Right here. That's Does that make sense? All right, no, I'm serious. Because that's yeah. because it is a continuity, right, after the, with senior with senior housing, with assisted living, and memory care, there's Absolutely. a different, it's a different uh, and, and, relational. And this is where the future of the delivery should look like. Yeah. The health system. How, how we can all integrate this. OK. Now on the data side, now what can you share with me on the, in terms of that perspective? So it's it's very interesting. Like uh, uh, this September, I was in uh, Stockholm attending the World Economic Forum Data Summit. Mm -hmm. and they did started talking about there has to be a collaboration across these various players on how they can come together, define a standard, define a protocol of sharing data. Mm -hmm. We have compliance issues. We have to kind of navigate through that. Uh, define a protocol of accessing this data. They started talking about fair data system. F is findable, mm -hmm. is, uh, A is accessible, I is interoperable. So this, these systems should be able to interoperate. Mm -hmm. And then uh, R is reusable. This okay. data should be reusable. Uh, in Europe, they have already started doing that because they have the benefit of, in Sweden, government kind of controls that. Mm -hmm. So they, they started a concept of a data train where everybody has access in each stoppage. But the access is limited to what those stops are. Maybe hospital system sees everything for a specific individual. Right. But us, from a senior housing, only see a certain level of... So it stops at that point? That point. Okay. Exactly. That's how the integration needs to happen. But that's not... Well, that's similar to what we have here to a certain extent, right? Um, exactly. Unless you can follow through with the medical record throughout. And that's where we need to go. Yeah. That's how the future should be. Yeah, it sounds like blockchain a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So let's go to the man who needs no introduction at the end here, and I'm going to back, go back to Anthony then. So I'm being, I'll, I'll be very honest. When I think a system in healthcare, I think hospital-centric. So I'm asking um, Roy, so looking from his perspective and his experience, so how do the economics 
um, as well as innovation factor in surgery centers and private practices factor into the overall healthcare delivery system uh, of the future? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm going to take a little time here. I feel like I've earned it. <laughs> um, so a little bit of history and then focusing on the future. Historically, the economics have been fantastic from my vantage point for us. Mm -hmm. um, I view healthcare as really um, maybe two-dimensional. One is the consumer dimension and the other is the provider dimension. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to make that clear for everyone that uh, the focus typically from consumers is on consumers. Right, their experience, what they're getting, what it's like to be a patient or a family member of a patient. I'm a consumer too, I'm a patient. I get those phone calls or lack of phone calls. I get those invites to join insurance company we uh, websites, interfaces that do or don't make sense. For me, as, as a Luddite, a self-proclaimed Luddite in technology, you know, I, I use technology as infrequently as possible. I'm generally scared of it. Um, so I, I'm probably somewhere close to the average, right? When we think about healthcare, the average consumer or patient sounds like me. Um, please, I, I assume that you're not gonna appreciate how expensive my time is, whether it's spending it with my kids or whether it's spending it at work. Um, you're probably gonna understate how expensive that time is and ask me to do things that I'm really reluctant to do. And then I don't even know if five minutes from now you're gonna upgrade something, I'm gonna be asked again to be retrained, or someone across the street is gonna show up with a better product and there I am using an old phone produced by Motorola when I should be using a new phone produced by Apple. I, I've never owned an Apple phone. So on the consumer end, healthcare, I would say we have a long way to go. Um, interestingly, as someone who's been on the provider end now for coming on 10 years, it's glaringly obvious as a provider what some key data points consumers would truly appreciate that they're still not really being offered. So the average consumer showing up to a physician uh, would be well known, would, would be well advised to look at things like adverse events, uh, a loss run history of that given physician, uh, a conversation about point of service, uh, why, Mr. Doctor Physician, are you, uh, that seems like a, an oxymoron, uh, but, but why, Doctor, are you asking me to have this procedure in your office versus a hospital, or why in a hospital versus a surgery center? Um, conversations about types of anesthesia and how they relate to different uh, points of service. These are very basic questions that seem awfully outside of our reach as users of healthcare. Um, and just, I'm going to use a little bit more time here. I find the whole concept of technology fascinating in that certain industries have migrated to technology interfaces so beautifully and so quickly, like entertainment, uh, or like transportation, or... Uh, personal transportation, hospitality, um, gaming, it all seems so natural, whereas, whereas other massive industries um, have really struggled. And we see it as consumers, you know, when's the last time you used a website to tell you which accountant you should use? Um, we sort of get some indications through Yelp, uh, but that's not necessarily insiders telling you uh, what to use and why as experts. That's users telling you what to do, and you have a level of distrust there as well, right? Is that 15 employees that just filled out that Yelp input, or is that genuine, insightful advice? So I would say as on the consumer end, we've made progress in healthcare in terms of access to general information. Uh, we can sort of do searches, but it's really not technical. It's really not specific, and I'm very excited for myself personally and my family to be introduced to wonderful consumer interfaces whenever they show up from wherever they might come, uh, Jeff Bezos or not, um, it's going to be great. Having said all of that, um, we've had a fantastic time with data um, on the provider end. So we're really excited to bridge that gap and bring consumers into a, a stage of empowerment, uh, which they love experiencing across as many industries as possible. Um, but we've been empowered as suppliers increasingly with every year that passes. This nothing changes in healthcare and things are moving so slowly where um, I agree with Deneen as a consumer, that's very accurate. I haven't seen much change. Um, I'm still not quite clear what I'm paying for my healthcare and I still find out 24 months later that I'm paying more for something that I thought I was. Um, but as a provider, things change every week. Things change every month. And the reasons why they're changing are not primarily, but certainly heavily influenced by sharing of information. 
Um, the other reasons why they're changing are, and this is a little bit counter culture, um, profit and greed. Um, so there's a large ecosystem in healthcare which includes politicians, the press, which includes administrators, which includes physicians. Some of those segments have, I think, mistakenly pointed at the US healthcare system as totally broken and totally outside what works. Um, and I would argue that actually profit is driving a lot of very good improvements in healthcare on behalf of consumers. They just mostly don't know it yet. Uh, but you sort of feel it, and I see it loud and clear in cost reduction and quality improvement. And you can inverse whichever one of those you want to focus on first. Um, but profit is a big motivator for change. And we are seeing a lot of capital empowering very good operators that had no business and no interest in healthcare. Um, whatever many years ago you want to go, suddenly participating in healthcare with great enthusiasm and excitement. And I can tell you as an operator of a large healthcare system, and we're in 20 states, 60 locations, um, and expanding rapidly, um, there isn't a minute that goes by that I don't worry about quality, reputation, um, uh, end product, consumer experience, and cost. All of those things are of great interest to me every day. So why all this transformation now on the provider end versus before? I would say before you had administrators and you had providers dominating healthcare. Very little in the way of management. I even think my experience, there's a few of us here that are 02, 03, Columbia uh, MBA graduates. I was actually 04, but I was there with the 03s. And um, healthcare really didn't come up. I was a, a generalist MBA who was interested in what I might do next, and I, I sort of avoided healthcare. I thought it was for management, maybe not really a welcoming place for me. And in, in hindsight, it's better to be a contrarian. You really want to go to those places that don't want you, <laughs> um, because that's where you'll make the biggest that's impact. Right. And so I didn't show up in healthcare as an administrator, and I didn't show up as a provider. I suddenly married into a large family of providers that spent 20 years telling me how I have no idea about healthcare, and healthcare has got nothing to do with the business side, and it's all about you know the technical side of being a physician. And Lord knows the f almost 600 physician partners that I have at this point, and I'm somewhat intimate with nearly all of them, they're really technically strong. I mean, that's one realization you really pick up very quickly. They have not been wasting their time developing tremendous expertise in what they do. And the, on the administration side, there's a lot of administration that's required in healthcare. There's an enormous amount of paperwork, and it is a unique industry. It's not perfectly substitutable with anything else. Having said that, there is an enormous vacuum for managers to show up and engage, not just in IT software development, which I stay away from, and frankly, the software that I use in my current company is really annoying, um, but for managers to do what managers do, which is to take all the lessons you learn in business school about best practice, about benchmarking, about incentives, about long-term brand development, about board governance, um, about how to change someone's behavior, about growth strategies, about joint ventures, about corporate development. You know, a good healthcare operator has a corp dev department. A good health operator has a salesperson that spends a lot of their time meeting, time meeting with other companies that seemingly may have nothing to do with their business, but the enlightening value add of making these connections between different providers is at the core of some of the most interesting change going on in healthcare today. That doesn't happen without a very true management department. So I think it's, it's very relevant that we're here as Columbia MBAs or with a lot of Columbia MBAs in, in the, the, um, the audience because I think that's probably the best test of how far we're coming in healthcare today in America that we're occupying an ever larger mind share of the Columbia MBA program. Thank you very much, Roy. I have a, another reiteration that that the concept of relationship and relational healthcare it seems to resonate so far uh, on the panel, and so I think that's going to continue. Um, I had nothing to do with have, not having your name tag, by the way. Just letting you know, <laughs> you no, could have mine. If you like. Tracy has two. He's on. He's on the yeah. panel this afternoon. Yeah, you can borrow one of mine. <laughs> you can borrow one of Tracy's. <laughs> so Anthony, um, you've gone from now to advisory board now to Optum, massive data data um, shop, obviously, and as well as connected with on the on between the firewall with uh, United. From your perspective at the advisory board and now Optum, so what do you think are the best opportunities? Because you're going to you see a lot, right? So you go across the whole the whole uh, continuum of care. Uh, the best opportunities for using that data to improve the care outcomes, 
and or patient experience, but also to shape what this future is going to look like. Oh, there we go. Oh, we found the card. We found the card, Roy. Oh. And he stole it. I, I, I had it. <laughs> Tracy gets an extra candy for that. <laughs> so, Anthony, so, so from that perspective, in terms of how you shape using data, because there is a lot of data. I mean, it's like more and more that we see, you know, it's like the, the volume of data is created every day is, is, is immense. Um, but also, too, in terms of how to use that and target that uh, in the perspective from previously advisory board, but now Optum, uh, to change the delivery system. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that we've been talking about as a panel is also the economic models that are in there, right? And so I think we're, as a country, shifting, and you hear a lot of talk in value-based care. And I think a lot of that is you get what you pay for. So as a country, we're shifting from look, we paid for procedures, so we got a lot of procedures. Mm. And now we're shifting to say, look, we actually want to pay for the outcome. And I think that's where the data can start to make the difference, to your point, in helping drive those economic models. I think the other thing that uh, Roy touched on very well is I think there's a lot of investment that's gone in on the consumer side and thinking about the consumer experience or the patient experience, um, maybe because a lot of us are patients and are dissatisfied with the system. But I think the piece that's missing to your question around where can data be more valuable is to the physicians themselves. And we're starting to get physician burnout. It was, it was brought up in the first session. So physicians on average are spending a, two extra hours at the end of their day just filling things out in the electronic medical record, which was supposed to make their jobs easier and allow them to you know, um, perform better and maybe go home earlier. So I think the trick is not anymore in the data itself. Sure, there's challenges around interoperability and what are the best analytics and mm -hmm. how do you get the best insights. I think more important is how do we get the right information, not all of it, the subset that's most important and most actionable to the point of care and deliver it in the existing workflow that the physicians now have. So. The EMRs are it. I mean, the game is over. Whether mm -hmm. you're using, you know, Epic or Cerner or all scripts, thinking that physicians are going to log into a separate portal or look at a report in the 15 minutes they have with a patient face to face, I think is is going to become pretty quickly ridiculous. Um, they don't have the time. We're asking them to do too much. So to me, the focus needs to be not just on how do we get the data, how do we make it more interoperable, how do we get the best insights, but I think the it's almost that last mile problem. How do we take those insights and deliver them at the point of care when the physician needs them to actually do something about it? And not in a way where they still have to digest the data. It has to be a very um, data-driven recommendation. And then I think the next step is how do you automate the workflow in the EMRs so that they can act on it. You know, again, if they disagree, great. Let them take a different action. Let them be able to disagree. But help them do it in a more automated way. I think that's the only way we're going to get to a point where we can actually drive better outcomes with data-driven recommendations through data-driven workflow. Now, when you look at some of the data models you have, I mean, so, uh, do you ever look at it from a standpoint of you know, what the economic impact of these data models will be to what's a physician practice or a health system and things like that and what the value could be. And, and, and do you have a look at that, that perspective as well? When you yeah, again, I mean, I think to some degree that part's actually easier in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? So um, keep people out of more expensive care settings, right? All the things that uh, Emmy was talking about. So how do you start to uh, meet the patient um, where they want to be met, you know, in the home, more virtually. And so I think the, the areas of opportunity are pretty clear, right? I mean, there's always mm -hmm. new areas you can find. I think uh, the more important part is how do you use the data to reinvent the care delivery model? You know, some of the things I'm sure you're doing, Roy, with your centers, and again, some of the things that Emmy talked about and that Tracy's supporting and that you're doing um, in the senior care community as well. So. I think the analysis and the opportunity areas is got to be how do you then deconstruct the value chain and reinvent it at each step so that you can get to the obvious areas of bending the cost curve, increasing quality, getting to better outcomes. Right. What, so, yeah, I find that really fascinating. Um, and that's certainly a huge catalyst for us on the management side is the access to, to data. Um, not having it is a non-starter in terms of information. It's interesting that you know, a lot of the data that we work with it doesn't stem from an EMR. Some really critical stuff comes from the EMR that we can't really close the loop on whether we have control over our business and the concept of quality or not without it. Um, 
But a lot of data comes from actually bringing physicians into the same place at the same time. Um, so it's amazing how difficult it is to have um, individuals practicing in thousands and hundreds of thousands of different locations that don't actually speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've seen on the supply end is um, physicians coming together with a, a real ma managerial culture behind them as opposed to just historically coming together in the form of employees at hospitals. Um, we've witnessed on the supply end a lot of change in hospitals over the last 10 years. You know, hospitals that felt a lot more ro robust, large, almost untouchable from a, from a reimbursement standpoint, um, seeing a lot of fragility and a lot of nervousness and actually squeezing down scale and improving operations. Um, and on the, on the physician end, what we've also seen similarly is you know, a change in mindset whereby I would be a better operator if I actually teamed up with as many physicians as possible as opposed to as few as possible. And part of that speaks to Anthony's point about I'm spending more and more and more of my time dealing with data. Who can I outsource that to? And a lot of that outsourcing is taking place to another layer, a, may a layer of management that really is best positioned mm -hmm. to maximize the use and the value of that data. Mm -hmm. Where that marriage is taking place, you're getting very good outcomes. Where it's not t taking place, you're seeing providers yeah. run out of business. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah I just, um, and I know we're, we're running short on time, but uh, there's an, an, an analogy that we used uh, back when I was at MDON, which is, that was kind of a data-rich uh, enterprise, uh, of data and analytics to the oil and gas industry, mm -hmm. right? Um, you need your raw material, your oil, your crude oil, um, first. You need your raw data. Right? Then you need, once you have that, and that's a challenge, it has to be across multiple payer types, multiple um, service categories, uh, different points in time, et cetera, claim data, lab data, EMR data, so forth. Then you need to take all that data and put it into your refineries. You need to refine it into end user products. Um, and you need really cool companies that do really cool stuff with data that make it actionable at the end, uh, end game. And then last, you need service stations. Right? You need dispense, you need distribution. And, and, and what's, what are service stations about? It's about, all about location and engaging systems, right? I, mean, I want to make sure I can only have to take a right-hand turn, I can get in and out off a freeway, uh, distance from the last time they filled, all the kind of store location analytics that go into locating a gas station. What is it about with, um, with, with data and analytics? Engaging the consumer, right? I think the struggles we had with data and analytics, and I spent 10 years at United Health Group some time ago, we, we dealt with this a lot back then, um, was, was in the front end, right? And then it was building all these really cool companies that do really cool stuff with data, and they're fascinating. There are a, million, a lot of really cool companies out there doing stuff with data. But the focus now, I think, is on that last piece, about how do you use what you've learned in this sort of omni-channel way um, and know which channel to use. So have multiple channels to engage consumers, right? Whether they prefer to be engaged digitally, mobile, in, in their home, uh, in, in a store, in their office. F f be able first to do all that, and then second, know which one they prefer, right? Using data and analytics, including psychographic, demographic, and other behavioral data to identify how they like to be engaged. I think that's where the science is now. Mm -hmm. um, and then making that engagement real and turning it into actionable behavioral change that improves our health and well-being. That's the cool stuff going on right now, and uh, I don't know that anyone's cracked the code on it, but there are some really fascinating companies doing work in that area. Do you, do you want a quick one? Yeah, but still, it's still in the process. I think. Yeah, agree. So if anyone has cracked the code or not, we, we do look at a lot of data that comes in, <laughs> right. and there are challenges in accessing certain set of data from our residents because of compliance issues. Mm -hmm. But once we have everything together, and as Tracy mentioned, the psychographics, demographics, we do look at all of those. Things. Yeah. And and again, to to your point, it can be done through a third party. They can just provide us the insight that we need to leverage, mm -hmm. or it can be in house. But it's still in the process. We are still not there yeah. to come and say that. That's what the Let me just quickly add, I, I, I haven't seen much success providing anyone insight. Uh, insight seems all, very consultative to me. And the world that I live in with 600 physician partners, insight, insight is interesting, but very hard to get change from a conversation with a physician that Nothing lasts, more beyond that that lasts 15 minutes while they're busy distracted by all their patients. Yeah. Yeah. What changes behavior, and by the way, I, if I was a gynecologist, I would be really proud of my father-in-law's gynecologist, all the babies that I delivered. My babies are the physicians whose behavior I've changed. 
That's what I'm proudest of. I don't get to interact with the patient face to face and change their lives, but I get to see the benefits of what it actually takes to change a physician's behavior. And insight is 1% of that equation, 1%. The other 99% is, what is your business relationship with that physician? Mm. How many times are you interacting with them? What incentives have you put in front of that physician? What peer group of other physicians are going to influence that physician? What follow-up? What level of education? So the idea that you're outsourcing, again, we, we tend to put too much faith in just data on its own. And I think, again, Deneen did a great job of this. Data on its own is not the solution for the things that we're executing on. It's far more engaged than that. Management gets us a lot closer. From a consumer standpoint, the good news is the bar is so low that a little bit of additional practical personal information will feel like a revolution to us because it's still so low. But on the management side, on the supply end, we're way past that. And we're seeing order of magnitude changes in the delivery um, model that we work within from one year to the next because that data is at its core being acted on by a strong management discipline. I mean, you well, my only comment is, is when you look at clinical data and you look at genomic data, it's still a great challenge to be able to come up with data definitions and to really clean the data so that it's meaningful. And it, 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 we have a long way to go. Um, we can spend days and days and days defining mortality, which I thought was pretty black and white, but it's not. <laughs> and that just gives it a small example. So I think that, and when you look at outcomes, it's all process and it's not really outcomes that we're looking at. So I think we still have a ways to go to make a meaningful contribution in the arena of, of data. Okay. I'm sad to say. Well, I, I, I want to do, ask you a quick question as well, Emmy, about um, your role in overseeing New York Presbyterian's venture funds. Everyone on this panel has gone through a transaction in the past 12 months, whether it's acquiring properties, right? Potentially, right? Um, the, uh, the CBS Aetna potential merger, Optum Advisory Board, and Roy with um, Front Frontier. So you sit on, you manage the NYP Venture Fund. So what's that approach? What's it, how do you evaluate the investment consideration? Is it a portfolio approach or is it a singular approach? No, we, we, we are primarily looking at investments that are uh, reflective of solving problems that we're experiencing in NYP. So we, by the end of March, will have uh, made investments in six companies. They are all companies that we are using. Um, three of them are artificial intelligence and three of them are pretty much uh, involve uh, telehealth. And so that is the, so we are, it's a small fund, it's $15 million. We are looking at million dollar investments, million to $2 million investments. I think the most interesting part about our fund is it is, we have a transformation center that's an IT based transformation center. We have an investment, we have $9 billion of investment that we do and we have, you know, finance and we have operations and we all work together to, to look at, first of all, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And secondly of all, do, are, is this a company that we want to invest in? Mm -hmm. So it is not it is not a traditional portfolio. You don't do approach. a side by side with, with venture capital and PE, or is it just? We we um, we tried to invest in a company that didn't have a venture capital partnership, and we found that that was a rather lengthy process yeah. uh, in terms of legal being satisfied that we were not going to be involved with a company that wasn't totally above board. So we now only pick companies that have venture Okay, great. That's uh, great. Partners. Okay, that's great to know. All right, so I, we have like a one minute before we're going to open uh, questions to the floor, but 10 minutes before we close out the, the, the panel, maybe even less than 10. Um, quickly, what do you think, each one of you, just quickly, what do you think are the biggest challenges to achieving whatever this future is going to be? Let's start with Emmy. Biggest challenges are reimbursement, are regulations, and then I think with the it, it, there's going to be a lot of ethical uh, issues associated with the integrity of artificial intelligence. Okay, Tracy. I, I would agree with with um, with those three. Uh, 
And the challenge for us as operators is uh, to turn every one of those into an opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, regulation and reimbursement is a real, it's going to be a constant challenge. Uh, I'm shocked at how, and disturbed at how little, particularly in our space, in the pharmacy space, those who profess to govern regulation and policy and reimbursement, how little they actually know about how uh, uh, our business operates. And so that's a day-in, day-out challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the ethical issues will continue um, to be, uh, rightfully so, um, things that we, um, we must navigate as we think about engaging consumers in this omni-channel way, in their life flow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that uh, that would be a challenge going forward. But each one of those becomes an opportunity if you think about it the right way. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks. Totally agree with Demi what she mentioned. Just to add to that, we, we really need a consistent and standard way of defining the outcome. How, how do you mm -hmm. measure the outcome? As long as that doesn't come through, whatever we're talking about in our area, if you're talking about wellness, if we don't define the outcome in a standard way, mm -hmm. which is acceptable across the industry, it's very difficult to kind of get to the same right. place. That's helpful. So I guess I'd add another layer to what they're saying. I think at the end of the day, as those things come together, it's the behavioral changes, right? So mm -hmm. how do payers think differently? How do physicians think differently and consumers, patients themselves? And how do we help everyone around these new aligned incentives drive towards those behaviors that are going to actually get to better outcomes? Okay. And Roy, finish us up here before we take questions. Uh, biggest, biggest challenges, um, always bad operators and uh, how they tarnish a lot of the good operators that are out there. Uh, we don't celebrate the good healthcare in this country enough, generally. Uh, biggest challenge relating to that is misinformation amongst public, press, and politicians, leading us to possibly unintended consequences in the wrong direction. And the biggest, biggest challenge is the US being what it is, 400 million citizens uh, that are doing their best to take care of each other. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition and it costs a lot of money. Okay, thank you. So we have room for one question. <laughs> whoever, whoever has a question, I have a question right here. There's a microphone coming your way. Mike Love, Dog, Columbia Business School. I teach uh, with Lorraine a, a course in uh, Innovative Models in Global Healthcare. And we look at different models across the globe. We realize that the U.S. is unique in having two separate systems, one called healthcare, title of your system, one called public health. Um, as you look at the future, do you see anything happening to sort of bring those worlds together? Um, and are you doing anything particularly in your companies with either state or local or tribal public health systems to innovate for the future? It's probably you oh. to start. So I'll start by saying that we are working on affordable housing and an early childhood and family hub that we're going to be creating because I think that public health really is not it gets can it's really the problem is it's about the social determinants of care and we have frequently focused on illness and not prevention as much as we should and I think that, that that's the first step uh, towards really looking at the holistic person. Um, so I think it's an interesting evolution in, in our continuing attempts to focus on public health. And I, I do think there's this yin and yang between public and private health. So, you, you know, CMS has led a lot of the innovation recently, but if you look at what happened and what helped them have the confidence to do that, the firms that didn't move away from managed care, so in states like California where they kept capitation, it allowed them to pay differently and let the providers figure out new models to deliver better care. So I think you're going to see that constant yin and yang. You're going to see innovation mm -hmm. that might start in the public sector or in the private sector, and we have to figure out how do we scale that? How do we democratize that so that the best practices really do get to the most number of people as quickly as possible? All right. I, you know, also we're in New York State, and New York State's going through the Medicaid reform, and social determinants health care is, is a very important piece of it. I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today, and thank our panelists for a great conversation. <laughs>